us in all things. In Yahweh Shai's most precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. When you're talking in the microphone, if you do not hear your voice presently in the speakers, then you need to get it a little bit closer to your mouth. You'll have to hold the microphone up. Uh, or else the people online will complain that they cannot hear you. All right, let's dive in. Okay, what, I have a question. Right off the bat, you're number one. <laughs> okay, so back to, I, well, I, okay, yes. so on Sunday, we were talking about, you said. I said? You heard me say? Well, so what I said, we were born in sin. Okay. You said, no. Yeah. Because, yeah, okay, so my understanding is, before Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, the world was perfect. There was no sin, right? Because there was no people. I'm talking about when Adam and Eve was... Before they did that, before Adam and Eve, there was no people. So there couldn't be any sin. Adam and Eve were the first people, right? Right. Okay. And they were the first people to sin. So before Adam and Eve, the world was perfect because there was no sin. Okay, so I, I, yeah, so I'm with you on that. Okay. So, but sin came in when they disobeyed the most high, right? Yes. So, wouldn't the people that come after will be born in a world of sin? Wouldn't that be correct? That's a because, different question than what you were asking before. Because I said we was born in sin. Born in sin. What, what does that mean, actually? Does that mean that I'm a sinner the minute that I start breathing? Because a lot of people think that you are a born sinner. You guys ever heard that before? Born in sin. Yeah, that is very much churchanity. Let's take a look at the scriptures a little bit more in depth. Because I know you were struggling with that last time. Go to James chapter 4 verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. Go ahead, somebody. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay. That verse tells you who is committing the sin. What's the answer? Who's committing the sin? Him, him that knoweth to do, to, to do good. That's right. So you have to know good and evil and choose to do what's evil in order for it to be a sin. Okay, so then what if a two-year-old no, don't know anything. Let's make it okay. Two year old and they and don't they, know anything. And they use an F bomb because they heard an adult or somewhere they picked it up. Yeah, F bomb somewhere. Yep. They committed. Let's something talk wrong. about a real sin because that's profanity and it is being profane. But let's talk about an actual, verifiable, biblical sin. The two year old does what according to the commandments? Stole something. Stole something. Right from a from a four year old, okay. Does he understand the difference between his and someone else's? No, no. So then he's in his natural state, but he has not committed a sin. Why did he know to do good and choose to do wrong? Because the scripture says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So then what? So then, okay, so this is where I'm having the conflict. All right, I have a, maybe I can help a little bit. Go ahead. Where, so the first time the young man, the, the two-year-old takes the four-year-old stuff, mm -hmm. he didn't know. Punished. We get Not him. punished. Or whatever. We are we, Corrected. He's, he's corrected. Correction okay. comes first. All right, he's corrected. He does it again. Now he knows and he goes and does it again. Where does that child lie? Okay, so uh, in the discipline of children, instruction must come first you have to instruct him first yours his don't take his we usually say does that make sense or do you understand we get them to nod their head a two-year-old is very difficult to make sure that it understands they can just be nodding their head for any other reason a few seconds later you see them do the exact thing that you just told them not to do you have to use discernment to figure out, are you being disobedient or did you not comprehend what was being said? Once you are certain that they comprehended what was being said and that they are being disobedient, now you correct them. 
instruction, correction, the final step is punishment. You don't go right into punishing them because you're not even sure if they understand what's being said. This is the reason why our parents always used to say, now I know you know better. Ooh, I do know better. I deserve to be punished because I know better. But if I didn't know any better, how can you expect me to do better? So the okay. sin comes in on, with comprehension of what's going yeah. on. That's exactly what the scripture said. Let's read it again. Okay. Monty, you got that? James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. There you go. Who's it a sin to? So the child that's born in the world, is he born in sin? He doesn't know right from wrong. He has to be taught. He has to be taught. Let's, let's. But, we, go ahead. So I'm conflicted because. Talking to Mike. I'm conflicted because if Adam and Eve didn't partake of the mm -mm. fruit. Sin wouldn't have Adam was told yeah, word was told. for word specifically what not to do. Right. And he did it anyway. And he did it anyway. That's what made it sin. Disobedience. That's right. Sin is just so, disobedience. Right. So, but once sin, sin into the world, everything died. Uh no. That's now, not I'm not saying like right away, but Adam would have lived forever if he wouldn't have ate of that fruit, right? If he wasn't disobedient. Well, no matter what the act is that Adam did, he would have lived forever if he wasn't disobedient. Because disobedience cannot live forever. What is the most important thing to the Most High? That you're obedient. Because what is your obedience proof? That you love him. Okay, so I understand that, but then... Okay, but watch... So a child, if a child is born in sin and they die at the age when they cannot speak and have fully not comprehended the commandments, Satan gets all of them because they all died in sin and they all go to the lake of fire. You think that's how the most high created the world? No, I, to my understanding, it's like an age of accountability. Where What would be the age of accountability? Is it an actual number? I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, me I heard you. 12, but okay. I'm not sure. I'm not going to say that. Let me show you what the sure. Bible says about the age of accountability. Okay. It doesn't actually use that term, but it tells you at what age someone should be able to be accountable. Okay. We're going to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. And all the people... Hold on real quick. Let I'm us, sorry. Because some people are flipping through Bibles. Some people online are like, Nehemiah, I never heard of that. <laughs> you know how they do. All right. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. Go ahead. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. What does it mean that they gathered as one man? Togetherness? They were all on one accord. They okay. had the same purpose. Go ahead. Uh, together as one man into the street that was before the water gate and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the which Yahweh had commanded to Israel okay so there this this is a special day and they're all gathered together and they're like yeah go get the law let's let's read what that law says go ahead and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women okay both of men and women, mm -hmm. look at this next age. Go and, ahead. And all that could hear with understanding. Pause right there. What's the age of accountability? People that can hear with understanding. If you understand what is being said to you, you are accountable to do what is being said. He's reading the law. There's men there. There's women there. And all that could hear with understanding are children. That they're old enough to hear and understand what is being said. Does so that is that sense? why, not the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, so is that why there was a uh, Kings that was young as seven and stuff like that? Because they was able to understand the law. I can't answer that part, but staying on topic. So the last line in this verse says upon the first day of the seventh month. So that verse is letting us know that they were keeping the holy convocation. Because the convocation on the first day of the seventh month is the feast of trumpets. And all of Israel is commanded to get together. Okay, so we find out here, it's men, I don't care how old you are, women, I don't care how old you are, and children who can hear with understanding. Because once it is explained and you understand it, now you are accountable to do it. 
Okay, let's go back to the other concept because this is very important. The only one who wants to push this doctrine of original sin is Satan and his messengers. He wants you to believe that the minute you received the spirit, what is the spirit? Rawak, breath. The minute that you received the spirit, you also received sin. Why would, why would the most high give you the spirit of life to breathe? That's where Rawak is, it's spirit. He put breath in your lungs and put sin in your mind at the same time? That sound like no, Satan. I I don't, I, I don't say that because the most high knows no sin. Okay. So, oh, I, but so did he create people to sin? No. He couldn't have created no. man to sin. No. So it has to be man's choice to sin. Right. And at that. what age does man make that choice? When he have here to understand. You've here. answered the whole thing. Go to first John chapter three, verse four. Now you can see that unless you believe that the most high set you up to go into the lake of fire. If you believe that, you just believe it. Otherwise, you cannot believe in this original sin idea. The Catholics created that. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Okay. What is sin? Transgression of the law. Okay. So uh, here's another thing that Satan does, because Satan knows that the transgression of the law is sin. He says, well... Let's just throw away the law. Let's just get rid of the law entirely and you do whatever you want. If there was no law, there could be no sin. I had not known sin except the law said thou shalt not. I had not known lust except the law said thou shalt not covet. Okay. I have a precept. Okay, what you got? Romans 7, 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Let's get that. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Y'all forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Amen. Okay, so then, I guess I'm still kind of conflicted because there's... So, when they ate the fruit, the forbidden fruit, we... Uh, got the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, yes, but let me explain what that means. Before they ate the fruit, what did they have the knowledge of? They only had the knowledge of good. Once they were disobedient, they had the knowledge of evil. Does that make sense? Yes. You can live forever if the only thing you know is good. Why? What does the scripture say about Yah? He good. Right? Yes. Okay, so you could live forever if you have that knowledge. But if you have knowledge of evil and you choose evil, you cannot live forever. You cannot choose evil okay. in the kingdom of heaven. That's going to be an impossibility. That's the reason why the law must be written in your heart, in your mind, so that all of your choices become right choices. And right choices are right choiceness. That is your righteousness. So the child, before he can know to choose, what is it? He's surviving entirely off of instinct. So I do whatever I want. Go. So, so here, here's the question then. Why does the child ever choose to do evil? Hmm. Okay. That's a great That's a question. Great question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the same exact question that Ezra, Esdras, asked the Most High. And he had to fast for like 21 days oh, and, and eat flowers in a field just to get an understanding of it. And I'm going to paraphrase what he said, what the Most High said. He said, Ezra, your heart has gone way too far in this world. And you think you can comprehend the way of the Most High? He said, I will ask you three questions of which if you can answer just one, I will tell you where the wicked heart comes from. And he says, here's the first question, Ezra. What is the weight of the flame? How heavy is fire? Ezra said, nobody knows how heavy fire is. The angel asked him a second question. Um, from where does the wind begin to blow? And he says, how can you dare ask me these questions? No man can know this. He realizes he doesn't know two of these answers. So the angel asked him the third question. He says, recall for me the day that has passed. Tell me everything that happened yesterday. 
And he says, these things are impossible. No man knows this. And then the angel says, I only asked you about the fire that you used to cook your food, the wind that blows on your face, and the day that you lived yesterday, things that you cannot separate yourself from, and you cannot understand those things. How will you understand the things of the highest? And that answer was sufficient for Ezra. Yes. Okay, that is a mic drop right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. The important thing to remember is Yah is a just Allah Hayam. He would not create you with the purpose of destroying you. Which of these things is more likely that uh, he wants you to just be born in sin and continue in sin and go where all sinners go? Or that he is not willing that even one should perish, but that all come to repentance. Amen. Go oh, what you got. I if if I may ask a question for that. Yeah. Um, precept um, numbers fifteen and verse twenty four. Numbers fifteen and twenty four. Twenty four. It is just related to sin. Amen. Um, it says, then it shall be, if ought, if ought be committed by ignorance, which is, or without the knowledge of the assembly, and all the assembly shall offer a one bullock for an ascending smoke. For Hold a sweet on, quick. Are you reading a New King James or a Sefer? Or? Sefer. A Sefer. Okay. Sorry. You want me to read? No, no. We will allow your Sefer. Okay. <laughs> you're going to notice, but you're going to, so I tell people the Sefer is the closest to the King James, but there's still going to be some discrepancies. Okay. But that's cool. Go ahead. Okay. So it's saying... If it, if it shall be, if I by committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the assembly, that all the assembly shall offer one young bullock for an ascending offering and a sweet smelling savor unto Yahweh or Yahuwah for his oblation and his drink and a drink offering according to the manner of one kid of the ghost for a sin offering. Mm -hmm. Because it's talking about a sin committed by ignorance or without knowledge. They still have to offer up a sacrifice. Because it's still a sin, but it's a sin by ignorance. So there are two forms of sins in the Bible. And this section in Numbers explains the difference. There is an ignorant sin, which means I still did it. I just didn't know that it was wrong. A sacrifice, a, a, a sacrifice still needs to be made for that. That's the reason why it says without the knowledge of the congregation. Because if the congregation had knowledge that you were doing that thing, what are they supposed to do? Correct you. That's Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. It says, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. But nobody knew that you was doing this thing and you didn't know it was a sin. And then it came out and we found out about it. We, we, we stone you and you die. No, that's not what happens. We have to make a sacrifice for that sin. So that's the ignorant sin. So how does that translate to today? To today? Yes. The reason why every single one of us are still in this room is because we were committing ignorant sins. And the scripture says in the time of this ignorance, what happened? He winked. He winked the at. most high winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to do what? Yes. Repent. So there was times when I didn't know I needed to keep the Sabbath. I, somebody tricked me into thinking I could eat anything I wanted. Oh, somebody told me the law was done away with. And I was like, good, I couldn't do that. St All of that stuff. I was tricked into believing and I didn't know. But now that I know better, he expects me to do better. So two types of sin, ignorant sin and presumptuous sin. Now watch in this same chapter that we're in, uh, after this sin offering is made, read verse 26. And it shall be forgiven all the assembly of the children of Yasharel and the stranger that sojourns with them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. See, everybody was ignorant to what was going on. Okay, but let's find out what happens if you know you're supposed to do right and you don't do it. Jump down to verse 30. But the soul that does ought presumptuously. What does presumptuous mean? He presumed to do it. On purpose. on purpose that's right you did it on purpose yep. you willfully disobeyed go ahead mm -hmm. whether he be born in the land or stranger or this or the same reproaches Yahuwah, oh, it says the same the same reproaches Yahuwah, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people wow okay that's the same commandment that we have today the same exact way it was there was grace back then 
but he doesn't make it so that you can willfully abuse the grace. Okay, so we're not born sinners. We're born into a world of sin. Is that safe to say? Mm, I wouldn't even go that far, but yes, that, so that is safe to say, but it's going to create some confusion. Sin entered into the world when Adam was disobedient. Right. But because this is an actual doctrine that people teach on a regular basis, I wouldn't word it that way at all. Uh, so Mike Waddle says, instead of saying it was born, I was born in sin, I say I was born into a curse because my parents didn't teach me the law. Okay, That's that works. A reasonable response. Absolutely, that is a definitely reasonable response. Um, one of the things about obedience, it does not require comprehension. Amen. You just have to do what you're told to do. Like if you have children, they're not going to understand a lot of the stuff that you tell them, but they are required to be obedient. Right. Same thing with the Most High. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have um, a scripture, John chapter 9, verse 39 through 41. John chapter 9, verse 39 through 41. All right. And Yahweh Shai said, for judgment, I am coming to this world that they would see Wait, not. Oh, I'm sorry. John 9, 39. Is that where we are? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Sorry. And Yahweh Shai said, for judgment, I am coming to this world that they would see not might see. Pause there. What is the reason Yahweh Shai says he came into the world? For the ones that can't no. see. What does it say? No. First line. For oh, judgment. judgment. He came in because Israel was executing judgment according to appearance. What does the scripture say? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So he is righteous and he came to demonstrate judgment that they which see not might see. What does that mean? He came to be an example, but he also came to be a light, a light to the blind. Keep going. And that they which which see might be made blind. Okay. So what does that mean? That those who are blind are able to see and those which can see or think they can see will be made blind. blind. He came to flip this whole thing backwards. Okay. Keep going. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? They said, are you dissing us? <laughs> it sounds like you just sneak dissed us, bro. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. How wish I said unto them, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. Pause there. Why would you have no sin if you were blind? Because you can't see. You'd be ignorant of all the things around you. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what in about the your world. Mom? What about the way that you think? Hmm. You think that way because of what you've seen, heard, and experienced. Yeah. Okay. So it says, if you were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye, now ye say, we see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. What does that mean? They think that they can see, so they continue walking in the direction that they think is right. They keep walking in their sin. Yeah. They're like, I see it. I'm doing the right thing. Bro, you were so far from doing the right thing because you think you're doing the right thing. Yeah. There's a passage in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10? Mm -hmm. And 26. Hebrews 10, 26. You know that one. <laughs> For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Okay. So if you choose to sin after you have received the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sins. What was the sacrifice for sins? Yahweh Shai is the sacrifice for sins. So you're not re relying on him anymore, right? Because he came to be an example and you decided not to follow his example, but to follow your own. That's a picture of leaning on your own understanding. Okay. That doesn't mean that you can't repent, but if you die in that state, if you have committed a willful sin and not repented and you die in that state, what should you be looking for? Verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. That's which fiery. Uh, I mean, my bad fiery that's how yeah <laughs> indignation which shall devour the adversaries amen so if you die in your willful sin you should be looking for the lake of fire because that's disobedience
Amen. Any other questions on that subject? Amen. Let us jump to the next online questions. God, I know we got a gang of them. Uh, yeah. I, I read these right here before. Just jump right into them. Oh, you want to go? Okay. Yeah. Oh. So this one was, uh, they're going through the Revelation series, um, and they want to go to Revelations one eleven. Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. Oh, you saw this one in the group? Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Revelations chapter 1, verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, writest in a book, and send unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Epheus, Ephesus. Ephesus. And unto Smyrna. Smyrna. And unto Pergamos. Pergamos. And unto Thyatira. Thyatira. And unto Sardis. Yeah. And unto Philadelphia. And unto Laodicea. 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 <laughs> good enough. <I> can... <laughs> I'm glad you read it. No, you did good. You did very well. Okay. The question here is an age-old question. It has to do with the deity of Yahweh Shai. Because Yahweh Shai just said that he is Alpha and Omega. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. Who else said that they were Alpha and Omega? The Father said he is Alpha and Omega. And now we have to rightly divide the word. I'm going to show you an example of it. So that was verse 11. I'm going to explain. Jump backwards to verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith Yahweh. Saith Adonai. Saith Adonai, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Oh, that even makes it crazier. Who did he just say he was? The Almighty. Some people read this and they say, so is Jesus and the Father the same? Because the Father is the Almighty. What they don't understand is that Christ is not on the earth while he's saying this. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, so what is the Father made of? He's made of light. What is Yahweh Shai? What did he say he was? The light of the world. Okay, can anyone in this room distinguish that light from this light when all you're seeing is the glow? So if Yahweh Shai is sitting at the throne on the right hand of the Father and there's so much light coming out of them, and they're one, not the same. How do you know which one is starting the sentence and which one is ending the sentence? Now watch. If you rightly divide it, you will see that they're both speaking. In verse 8, one of them says, I am Alpha. And what does the other one say? I am Omega. One of them says, I am the beginning. What does the other one say? The end. Saith Adonai. Watch. Which is and which was and which is to come. And then what does the other one say? Almighty. The Almighty. They're together in this location and they're together speaking and I can prove it in multiple verses. Now if we jump down to verse 11, it says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest write in a book. Okay, so that's what he's saying. We've established that he is the first and he is the last. Let's now establish that both of them are there. Just because you're reading it in red doesn't mean that the Father is not there. When you take into consideration, Yahweh Shai is not walking around on the earth. He's in heaven seated at the, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Let me also show you some verses from the Old Testament when Yahweh Shai was seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Father was speaking and he says the same thing because both of them are right there. There are many times in the Old Testament when Yahweh Shai is speaking. We know it. Because we read it to say Adonai versus saying Yahweh. Let me show you a couple examples. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6. This is probably the clearest example, even though it's not written in red. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6. Okay, go ahead. Thus saith Adonai. Uh -huh. Nope. Okay. Thus saith Yahweh. Yahweh. Who is he? 
Okay, go ahead. And the Redeemer. Wait, I read it right. And his Redeemer, the Lord. Oh, we cannot hear you in the mic, so they can't hear you online. Yeah, we can't hear right. Thus saith, thus saith Yahweh, the King of Israel. Who's talking so far? Yahweh, the King of Israel. Go ahead. And his Redeemer, Yahweh Sabaoth. Who's talking so far? Is there not two people talking? The Father is talking, and his Redeemer is also talking. And look at what they say. Go ahead. I am the first. The Father said that. I am the last. Yahweh Shai said that. And besides me, there is no God. See that? They're one. They have always been one. Remember, the Godhead says there are three that bear record in heaven, and these three are one. So when you're reading through the scriptures, anytime it's talking about the first and the last, Alpha and Omega, it's talking about both of them. There's not contradiction there. Both of them are speaking. Kind of like if Greg picked up the microphone. Pick up the mic real quick, Greg. Okay, and if somebody is listening online, but they're not watching, and I said uh, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. We both said that. Does that make sense? Because you're not seeing us, you're just listening, but that's what was said. Okay, that's our first answer. This person has like four questions that they're oh, asking. All right, so hold on. Before we move on to the next one. Um, there is a question that's really similar to this. Okay, go that, um, So it says, um, please clear this up for me. Um, these two questions might have the same answer. It's um, Isaiah 43, 10 and 11 uh, states that Yahweh is the only uh, savior. Modern Christian says that Yahweh Shai is the savior. How can we um, uh, reconcile this conflict? And then he gives another scripture. It says, uh, 2 Philippians uh, 2, 9 through 11. It says, Yahweh Shai is given the name above all names. Is there names. more than one Philippians? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> wait, the wait. second question. Oh. I apologize. Oh, okay. The I second like, question wait, is Philippians. What Bible you read it? You got, um, give me third Philippians. It's right next to second opinions. <laughs> uh, should not uh, Yahweh's name be the name above all names? Okay. These are These are... These are relatively easy to explain. Okay, give me the first part of that question. Uh, the first part is um, in Isaiah 43, um, 10, 11. Says, Let's go there. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. Uh, yes, verse 10 through 11. Mm -hmm. Here are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, and my servants whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no Yah form. Mm -mm, no God, no God form. form. Uh -huh. Neither shall there be after me. Okay, so he's saying that he's the only one. Ain't that right? Okay, verse 11. Go ahead. I, even I, am Yahweh, and besides me, there is no Savior. That's right. That's absolutely true. There is one most high, and there is no salvation without him. Who is he going to send to do the salvation? Is he himself going to step down out of heaven, walk on the earth, and round up all of his people? No, he's not. He's going to send the sun. So um, if I decided to build a building, and I'm funding the building, and I create the design for the building, I'm probably not going to actually lay the bricks of the building. When the building is done, it's all said and done, and you guys come and sit in my building. We will not say that the foreman or the, the guy who rolled the cement or this person who put the fence around it built the building. Who will we say built the building? I built the building. So when we get into the kingdom, who will we say saved us? The Father saved us. Who did he send? Yahweh Shai to do that. Who did Yahweh Shai send? His angels. What are what what is that? I just explained the Godhead. These three are one. So when it says there is no savior, uh, beside me there is no savior, it is still inclusive of Yahweh and Yahweh Shai. Give me that other verse in there real quickly. Uh, Philippians uh, two, nine through eleven. Philippians chapter two, verse nine. Okay. Uh, the question that the person is asking based on this verse is, shouldn't Yahweh's name be above every name? 
And here's what people don't understand about the name or the person, Yahweh Shai. Yeah, and as I say this, it's going to be slightly confusing. You guys ready? Yahweh Shai is the father's name. His name is not Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai, the person, is the name of the father. See how that's slightly confusing? If I said, what is the father's name? You would say Yahweh. If I said, who is the father's name? You would say Yahweh Shai. And when the scripture says that his name is above all names, it is above all names. So we pray to the father in the name Yahweh Shai. Without that name, how are you going to get to the father? Now watch what it says in the scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Wherefore, Yahweh also hath ha highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Mm. Wait, his name is above every name. Keep going. That at the name of Yahweh Shai, every knee shall bow. Of, of these, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. Okay, now you're going to see something amazing in the scriptures. Because an exception has to be made. Because this scripture just said, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven. Where's the father sitting at? So do we think that the father bows at the name of Yahweh Shai? No, the scripture says an exception is made for the father. Everything that has ever existed with the exception of the father bows at the name of Yahweh Shai. If the scripture did not say that, then the question that this person is asking would be accurate. That Yahweh Shai's name would be, uh, that the father's name would be the highest. Let me show you the verse that I'm referring to. Or we would have a contradiction it, Except the Bible says this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 27. This is the power of reading precept upon precept. Because there is one line in this selection. That proves that the father does not bow down to the son. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 27. Go ahead. For Someone. he hath put all things under his feet. Okay, so he is the father, hath put all things under his, that's Yahweh Shai. He put all things under Yahweh Shai's feet. Isn't that right? Okay, keep going. But when he saith all things are put under him. But when the father saith that all things are put under Yahweh Shai, go ahead. It is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Take a look at that word accepted. What does that word mean? It's not A-C-C-E-P-T-E-D, which means I accepted your payment. This is E-X. What does that mean? An exception is made. Does everybody see that? For when he, the father, hath put all things under his, Yahweh Shai's feet. Okay? But when he, the father, saith all things are put under him, Yahweh Shai, it is manifest, that means it's made known, clearly seen, that he, the father, is accepted. An exception is made, which did put all th things under him. Does everybody see that? The father can never be put under the son's feet. So when the scripture says all things, it means all things except for the father. There are, there's not a single contradiction in these scriptures. The only thing that ever contradicts is our understanding or our ability to read what has been put in these scriptures. Now watch, read verse 28 and it's going to prove what I just said in clearer language. And when all things shall be subdued unto him. Everything is put under uh, Yahweh Shai. Then shall the son also himself be subject unto him. Then shall Yahweh Shai also be subject. Is that above or, or below? below? Below him, the father. Go ahead. That put all things under him. See? That. That Yah may be all in all. Amen. That's what makes him the most high. He is all. If I wanted to say his name in Hebrew, I would say all. 
That's how you say God's name, El. Modern Hebrew is El. Ancient Hebrew is All. What is he? He's All. Does everybody understand that part of it? Okay. So all this time, uh, when the Bible in the Old Testament is talking about his name's sake, everything that the Father does for his name's sake, it's all for Yahweh Shai. He loves him that much. Let me just show you a verse real quick. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 22. Let's start this one at. Uh, let's, let's start this Ezekiel 36, 19. For those of you that are watching us online and having some problems, we are fixing those internet problems this week. Did it stop the stream? You still good? Okay, let's keep running. Ezekiel 36, 19. We are going to see that everything that he does is because he loves the son. Why does he love the son? Why does he love the son? Anybody ever thought about Why does the most high love the son so much? Ultimate obedience? Because he's obedient. He would love you just as much as the son if you were obedient. And that's what every single word in this scripture is designed to make you like. The sun should be forming inside of you. As you read these scriptures, you're just, you're modifying your DNA to be more and more like Yahweh Shai. Okay. Ezekiel 36, 19. Go ahead, somebody. And I scattered them among the heathen. And they were, dis and they were dispersed. And they were dispersed through the countries according to their ways and according to their doings. I judged them. So we wanted to do whatever we wanted to do and not be accountable to his commandments. So he said, that's what you want to do. Go ahead and do that. But verse 20, go ahead. And when they entered and when they entered unto the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. We profaned his holy name. Why? We were taking his name in vain. We were misrepresenting the children of Yah. Okay, keep going. When they said to them, these are the people of Yahweh mm. and are gone forth out of his land. If somebody identifies you as the people of Yahweh and then sees you committing a sin, you are profaning his name. Does that make sense? Let's keep reading. Verse 21. Let's see what he has pity on. But I had pity for my holy name. Mm. It's the house of Yasharel had profaned among the heathen, whether they went. Keep going. Therefore, say unto the house of Yasharel. That mic is giving a bad signal. It says, therefore, say unto the house of Yasharela, thus saith, who's talking right here? Take a look at that verse. It says, thus saith Adonai Yahweh. Who's speaking? Yahweh Shai is speaking. I do not this for your sakes, O house of Yasharel. But for mine holy name's sake, Yahweh Shai is doing this for his own name, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye want. Verse 23, and I will, so real quick, if you're reading in the Sefer, read verse 22 for us. Let's see what it says. Therefore say unto the house of Yasharel, thus say Adonai Yahuwah. Perfect. That's great. So that clearly shows you that Adonai is speaking. Adonai, Yahweh, is Yahweh Shai. Okay? So he's saying that, and he's saying he's doing it for his name. Make sense? Verse 23, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am Yahweh, saith Adonai Yahweh, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. You have to be able to see when both of them are speaking. It's, it's crucial. You know, the scripture says that the book is written of Yahweh Shai. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O Yahweh. So, all right. I just wanted to show that real quick. This person has four questions, I believe. Oh, no, so that was related. Go to question number two from this person. Um, I had just a qu question yes. I wanted to ask about the Yahweh um, Saba Oath. Yeah. That's Yahweh Shai? Yahweh Saba Oath, the Lord of hosts, the mm -hmm. Lord of armies, is Yahweh Shai. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Go. Are, you're talking about the Ephesians one, or we did that one above above no, every go. names? They're asking question number two. Oh, explain um, where the seven churches are. Okay. So the this lesson. this question is um, it's not being asked properly. Uh, I think that I fear that this person may think that the church is the building. Doesn't it sound like they're asking where the churches are as in where the building is located in order for me to answer this question. I'd have to say, here I am right here. This is where the seven churches are. We're right here. The people of the most high are scattered all over the world and have been for a very long time. You're not going to go anywhere in the world and walk into the church in Smyrna or Philadelphia but you will meet a person who has the heart of Smyrna or the heart of Philadelphia. Now, here's another interesting thing about the seven churches. Five out of these seven churches get rebuked for false doctrine. What if some of those churches that get rebuked are actually churches that exist now and you've been talking bad about them? What if one of those churches is Jehovah's Witnesses? says this he says this about one of the churches this uh, I have against you that you suffer that woman Jezebel to teach what do what did Jehovah's Witnesses believe in or seven-day Adventists they believe in that female prophetess what if they're actually one of his churches they're just so far away from where they're supposed to be that they need to be rebuked because he rebukes five out of the seven churches so we got to be very careful when we're talking about these Mormons and these Christians and all these other people because they may still be one of the churches of Yahweh Shai, just not where they're supposed to be at. Okay, so that answers that question. The church, the churches, the seven churches are here, everywhere because they're people. Go. The next one is Revelations twenty-one seventeen. Revelation chapter twenty-one. Can you explain what this verse is? Verse seventeen. Oh, yeah. Okay. This one is, is kind of easy. This one is just, yeah. Um, this one is just asking, the person is asking about one word in the scripture because it relates to another thing, but they're not related in the context of the Bible. The words are related. The context is not. Revelation chapter 21, verse 17. Go ahead. And he measured the wall thereof at 140 and four cubits. How big is it? 144 cubits how big is a cubit 18 inches 18 inches so you take 18 and you multiply it times 144 and now john is going to tell you about the person who's doing the measurement it says according to the measure of a man that is of the angel the angel that john is seeing is actually what a man everybody see that now i, I you guys remember in the Revelation series, I tell you that all of the prophets saw the same thing. And when John the Revelator was seeing his vision, Ezekiel was there, Daniel was there, Zechariah was there. These people saw the other men and referred to them as angels. Right here, John is referring to the angel, but he knows that it's a man. So he tells you it's according to the measure of a man. That is of the angel. The angel is measuring it according to the cubits. The person's question that they're asking is, is this 144 related to the 144,000 that gets sealed? And the answer is no, they're not related. And so Jeff, can you give me, what was the, um, cause I've been, I've been watching the revelation series. Good. I started one. It's like watching season one of, 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 of 24. When you go back to the beginning, <laughs> there's anyway. 52 of those. <laughs> I know. 52 uh, hours just, of revelation breakdown. Yeah. It's old school. Yeah. Um, at the beginning. <laughs> uh, but, what who are the so is it important especially when you're trying to understand revelations because I, I started in daniel but you said ezekiel daniel who are the other prophets john the baptist who are all not john the baptist or sorry john, john the revelator john the revelator so john is there daniel is there zechariah is there ezekiel is there but they're not all there for each account for instance, when you're reading Daniel, we find out that Zechariah is there and John is there. But when you're so they'll get transported into the spirit and they refer to the spirit as a place 
without time. And it is. There's no time in the spirit. So if I'm in the spirit and you're in the spirit, though you live a thousand years after me, we're both there at the same time. And because you're there, I'm like, you're an angel. But you got transported from your time into the spirit. And when you see me, what do you think I am? An angel. So when you write down your writings, you'll say, and the angel said unto me, but an angel is not talking to you. John is talking to Daniel. Daniel is talking to John. Both of them are talking to Ezekiel. The prophets would get moved into the spirit outside of time and they would converse. Now, when I, when I continue to study that, I'll be able to see the people that are in there? Yes, you, you will. Okay. Yeah, you will. Especially if you're going through the Revelation series, I will show you the precepts where they're both describing the same thing from different places in the room. Amen. All right. Um, it just reminded me of this question in here. It says, can we cover minor and major prophets? Is it a real thing or a the theological perspective? Uh, major and minor prophets is not a theological perspective. It's bibliology. Bibliology is the study of the Bible, not what's in it, but the actual book itself, how it got to be named, why the books are in the order that they are. So minor prophets versus major prophets is not located inside the Bible. It's located in bibliology. They're considered minor prophets if their books were short. It's that simple. So Obadiah, uh, Amos, Nahum, those are all minor prophets because they had very short books. Whereas Isaiah, Daniel, those guys are major prophets because they're huge books. That's all it is. That person has a, another question. That same person. Let me get that other one out of there. Uh, the other one is, can we elaborate on Second Chronicles 13.5? Second Chronicles 13, five. What is the covenant with salt? Oh, oh yeah. All right. Somebody read it. Ought ye not to know that Yahweh Allah of Yasharala give the kingdom over to Yasharala to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt. Okay. I don't know what that means. Wow. I don't know everything. <laughs> I know people come here and they think I know everything. I do not know what the covenant of salt is. So we're going to pray about that and hopefully he will reveal it to somebody because he has not revealed it to me. Yeah. Let's move to the next one. <laughs> people are like, Oh, what? He didn't know the answer. I'm going to another church. Oh, they have another question. I think this is from the same person. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, First Chronicles one twenty nine. First Chronicles. Is there a one. book of Gad? Yes, there is a book of Gad. First Chronicles chapter one verse twenty nine. The real question is, where is the book of Gad? First Chronicles. Read that. Or give me that again. Uh, First Chronicles one twenty nine. Nah, it's the wrong verse. Uh, what? Yeah. Um, but I am familiar with the question. <clears throat> First Chronicles 29, 29. Go there. Now the acts of David the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer. We know the book of Samuel, right? That's first and second Samuel. Go ahead. And in the book of Nathan, the prophet. Wait a minute. What book is Nathan, the prophet? It's not actually called the book of Nathan. It's called the book of first and second Kings. Keep going. And in the book of Gad, the seer. Okay. So here's the question. Is there a book of Gad? Yes, there is. The scripture just said there's a book of Gad. Do we know what it, where it is today? No, we do not. It is not located in our 66 books. It's not located in the 14 books of the Apocrypha either. Let me show you how that's possible, that there can be a book that we don't have or don't know where it is. Um, we're going into the Apocrypha. 
Second Ezra chapter 14. Verse 44. Second Ezra chapter 14, verse 44. The Bible tells you how many books should be in your Bible. Second Ezra chapter 14, verse 44. In 40 days, they yeah. wrote 204 books. Pause right there. Okay, so there was a time when all the books of the Most High were burned and there was no Bible, there was no law. And you know, we was buck wild at that point, right? We did whatever we wanted. And so he blessed Esdras with the ability to rewrite all of the books that were written before and to future write all of the books that would be written. So when we're reading Revelation, and John the Revelator wrote it, he rewrote it. Esdras wrote it to begin with. Does that make sense? Okay, Esdras wrote the completed Bible, and all the rest of the people rewrote the part. Okay, in 40 days, and so he did what he did with uh, Moses, he separated him for 40 days and 40 nights. He made him fast. And during that time, he wrote, he didn't write it. He prophesied it. So he was sleeping and speaking. And the scribes, five scribes were writing down everything that he said. Let's jump backwards so that you guys can understand this story a little bit better. This is a, a phenomenal story. All right. Jump backwards to verse 29. <clears throat> Our fathers at the beginning were strangers in Egypt. From whence they were delivered. Keep going. And received the law of life, which they kept not. Hold the mic up a little closer. Which ye also have transgressed after them. Keep going. Then was the land, even the land of Zion, parted by you, parted, parted among, among you. you by lot. But your fathers and ye yourselves have done unrighteousness and have not kept the ways which the highest commanded you. Okay, so he's already established a time frame. Our fathers, they were strangers, they broke the law. They received the law, they broke the law. So we know that what he's writing about is after coming out of Egypt, after the receiving of the commandments. Jump down now to verse 34. Therefore, if so be that ye will subdue your own understanding and reform your hearts, ye shall be kept alive, and after death ye shall obtain mercy. So he just explained how you get into the kingdom. The angel is speaking to him. You need to subdue your own understanding. That means you need to stop thinking you know everything. And reform your hearts. It means your heart is formed out of stone. It needs to be formed in the flesh. It needs to be reformed. Okay? What happens if you do that? You shall be kept alive. And after death ye shall obtain mercy. Okay? So then you're going to go into the kingdom. Now watch. Verse 35. For after death shall come I'm sorry, for after death shall the judgment come when we shall live again and then shall the names of the righteous be manifest and the works of the ungodly shall be declared. He just told you about the judgment. Does that make sense? Okay. Now take a look at verse, jump one verse to 37. Pick it up, somebody. Go. So I took five men as he commanded me and one, and we went into a field and remained there. Keep going. And the next day, behold, a voice called called me, saying, Ezra. Pause right there. The next day, a voice called me, and this proves that I'm his sheep, because I heard the voice call. Everybody see that? Most high be calling you. Sometimes you don't be listening. <laughs> he, just, he, he knew that he was being called. And then here's the instruction that the voice gave him. Go ahead. Open thy mouth and drink that I give thee to drink. Okay, so open your mouth. I'm going to pour something in your mouth. Verse 39, go ahead. Then opened I, uh, what? Then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full as it were with water, but the color of it was like fire. Isn't that similar to what uh, Jeremiah said? When the word gets into your bones, what's it like? Like a fire shut up in your bones. Okay, now watch this. Verse 40 says, and I took it and drank. And when I had drunk of it, my heart uttered understanding and wisdom grew in my breast. For my spirit strengthened my memory. 
do you see what it says? If his, if the spirit strengthened his memory, that is exactly what Yahweh Shai said the Holy Ghost would do. But the Holy Spirit, whom the Father shall send in my name, what shall he do? Bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So his memory is strong now. That's a space-time continuum issue right there, but I'm not going to get into that. Verse 41 says, and my mouth was opened and shut no more. The highest gave understanding unto the five men, and they wrote the wonderful visions of the night that were told. Pause right there. So when, what does the scripture say? How does the most high speak to you? For Yah speaketh once, yet twice, yet man perceiveth it not. When? In a dream and slumberings upon the bed. Why does, why, there's five, look, you guys got to put yourselves in the room. Ezra is laid out on a mattress and there's five men around him with notebooks. And they're like, as soon as this dude falls asleep, bro, he going to start saying some stuff and I got to write down every word. Ezra don't know what he's saying. He's in it. He's saying it and somebody else is writing it down. The people who write it down are called scribes. Does that make sense? Okay, watch. It says, they wrote the wonderful visions of the night that were told, which they knew not. And they sat 40 days and they wrote in the day and that night they ate bread. Somebody pick it up at verse 43, please. As for me, I spake in the day and held not my tongue by night. So he's speaking the whole time. Go ahead. In 40 days, they wrote 204 books. How many books do you have in a modern day King James Bible? 66. 66. If we add 14 books of the Apocrypha. 80. 66 plus 14. 70. What is it? 70. Uh, see, I remember there's only three types of people. Those that can count and those that can. <laughs> How many books do we have? Okay, watch this. We have 66 books plus 14 books. How many books do we have? Man, this, see? 80. Okay. Okay. 66 plus 14 equals 80 books. Everybody agrees with that math? This is very important. How many books does it say that they wrote? 204. Okay, now watch. Keep going. Verse 45. All right. And it came to pass when the 40 days were fulfilled that the highest spake, saying, The first that thou hast written, publish only. Mm -mm. Publish what? Pub publish openly. Uh huh. That the worthy and unworthily may read it. Pause right there. Okay. The first portion that you wrote, let everybody read it. So, what if some of these books that you're calling false writings are actually part of the 204 books that the Most High spoke through Ezra. He said worthy and unworthy. That means righteous and wicked. Some of these books, they do contain the mysteries of the Most High in them. But let's find out about the second selection of books. Keep going. Okay. But keep the 70 last that thou may deliver them only to such as be wise among the people. Keep going. Uh, my translation cuts off after. Oh, I got it. Is that right? Go. For, for in them is the spring of understanding. What's in these 70 books? The spring of understanding. Go ahead. The fountain of wit. Uh huh. And the, stream of and the stream of knowledge. Verse 48 says, and I did so. Let's do some math real quick. How many books did they write total? Two. Okay, uh, and so he said the 70 last books that you have, only give those to the wise. But how many books do we have in our King James Bible with the Apocrypha in it? 80. 80. Here's the issue. We only have 70. If we take 1 Kings and 2 Kings and we just call it King. Kings and we take 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and we just call it Amen. and we take 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and just call it you reduce all of those books, you're going to get these 70 last books because in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the stream of knowledge. Sometimes people will pull up a book and you'll be like, what, the gospel of who? 
bro, I don't know. I don't trust that. It's got some good stuff in it, but I don't know if I can trust it. It could be one of those 204 books. I don't need those. That's for the worthy and unworthy. What I need is these 70 last books. I need to make sure that I am reading the 66 plus the 14. Here's the, I, I've read several other books. Let me explain this. Several other books. I've read a portion of the Book of Mormon. I've read, I've read some crazy stuff. Let me tell you what none of them have in them. Instruction on how to live forever. I don't care what you're reading. You can read the gospel of anybody you want. The book of so-and-so. The book of the dead. It's not going to tell you how to live forever. What's going to tell you how to live forever? These books right here tell you what you must do in order to be pleasing in the eyes of the Most High. Amen? Amen. So, of making many books, there is no end. If they wrote a book that talked about everything that Yahweh Shai did while he walked on the earth, what does the scripture say? Let me room it up. The yeah. earth could not contain all of the books. But the most important things are here. It's the law and the testimony. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. I have a question really quick while we're over in the in in, in the apocrypha a little bit. Um, yeah. I was watching uh, uh, the ish uh, Benny, the boy over from. Uh, Bro, don't be watching that ish. Well, I was watching him in <laughs> Congress like today, and um, he he made mention of the Maccabees, right? And then he made mention of the Maccabees having whatever, but. I, my question, when he when he brought them up, my question was, were the Maccabees a part of a certain tribe of Israel? Yeah. Of Israel? Were they Judah, Benjamin? Do we know what tribe they were? Yeah. Can I? So, let's just prove it real quick. The, the, the Maccabees were priests. They're from Levi, but let me show you real quick. What, what you got? Well, I was going to say, um, so the northern tribe were already gone by then, so it's one of the three. Yeah. They have to be one, one of the three. Um, that's a good way to Judah, Benjamin, Benjamin or Levi. And Levi yeah. Okay, go to First Maccabees chapter two, verse one. First Maccabees chapter two, verse one. Go ahead. Oh, I'll read it. It's got some. So it says, in those days arose Mattathias, the son of John, the son of Simeon, a priest of the sons of Joarib from Jerusalem and dwelt in Modin. So he's a priest. What tribe are priests? Levi. And he had five sons. Jo that says Jonathan and Cadus, Simon called Thassai, Judas, who was called Maccabeus, Eleazar called Aravan, and Jonathan, whose surname was Aphis. Here's the interesting thing uh, Maccabeus or Maccabee is not their last name. Like we talk about Judas Maccabeus or the Maccabees. They're called the Maccabees because of Judas's reputation. Um, Maccabee means hammer. So they were the hammer of the Most High crushing the opponent. Judas Maccabeus. Okay. So yeah, they're, they're Levites. Levi. Right. He, said they were, he said they were from Judah. It was wild. Now that you say that. Is right? it is a ish? It was uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. They're, 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 yeah, they're he don't know. Yeah. He's a ish. What was that last verse? Huck? That last verse was 1 Maccabees chapter 2, wow. verses 1 through 5. All right. Any questions in the room? Yeah. Jessica. Oh. oh. Okay, go. Jonathan. You're good. You, it's on. So I was wondering if um, I was understanding the, the scriptures correctly in the sixth day in Genesis that that was mankind was created and then adam was created on the on the uh on the eighth i'm not the eighth day but separately i should say mm. no so let me explain that um and there are many people that believe this uh go to genesis chapter one What you're about to experience is the power of numbers in the Bible. And if, uh, if people are not familiar with the power of numbers, they won't see what the Most High is doing. 
you have to believe that not only he didn't only create the word he created the numbers it's the word the numbers and the punctuation right the sequence in which the words are spoken tells a story and so uh, we study the numerology of the Bible pretty heavily but one is the number of Yah two is the number of division but it is also the first it is the first experience with the preset because in order for me to have a preset, I need to have more than one. So we have an account of the creation of Adam in Genesis chapter one. And then we have our first set of precepts in Genesis chapter two and nothing else in Genesis chapter two is going to precept with anything in Genesis chapter one, except for the creation of the man. From that point, after we've established the two, Every other thing in the Bible has precepts. Got it? So Genesis chapter 1, most people think because they're not aware of precept must be upon precept. They think he created him on, he created mankind on the sixth day and created Adam on a different day. But that wouldn't make any sense, right? Let's look at the scriptures and see what it says. Genesis chapter 6 verse 26. And Yah said, let us make man in our image. Pulse right there. Hold your finger down to the word man. All right? What does it say in Hebrew? Adam. Let us make Adam. That's how it's pronounced. In our image. Is that singular or plural? That's plural. So when it says, and Yah said, that has to be read as an Alahayim. Because Alahayim is plural. Yah is singular. Does everybody understand that part? And uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis, did I say 6? Oh, because he mentioned on the sixth day. This is the sixth day. I'm sorry if I got ahead of myself there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Monty, did you check that water? Yeah. We good? It's going. It, uh, it's... Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Go ahead, read it again. And Elohim, right? Yep. That's it. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. Go ahead. After our likeness. Okay. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. Did you say creepy thing? Creepeth. Because there's some creepy creeping? stuff out there. <laughs> A creeping thing. Okay, got it. <clears throat> So man was given dominion. What does dominion mean? Authority. Power, authority over everything else that exists. You still have it. The problem is when sin entered into the world, you gave your dominion over to sin. You have to take your dominion back. Your life will change once you take your dominion back. You're like, sin shall not rule over me. That's what I get to say. Sin don't rule over me. Does that make sense? Okay, watch. Let's keep going. So, well, Elohim. El mm -mm. Now watch, it changes. Go ahead. What? So it's so Yah created so, man in His own oh, image. Because it's uh, See, singular. It, it became singular right Got there. It. I have a quick question before we go. So in, in twenty six it said, and, and Yah said, "Let us make man in our image." Was was that him and Yahweh shy? And the Holy Spirit. And the there Holy are three, three that bear record. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. And so, what is man? Man is an image of the Godhead. Okay, man yeah. is flesh that needs to be made the word, just as Yahweh Shai was the word made flesh. Okay, verse 27, so Yah created man in his own image. Who actually created the man? You guys know, the scripture says, it says Yahweh Shai made everything that was made. Okay, but whose idea was it? It was the father's. That takes us back to my example about who made the building. The person who paid for the building and laid out the blueprint, who actually did the work, the foreman, the guy pouring the cement, the guy setting the foundation and making the measurements. Okay. Nobody remembers that guy's name. We just know Trump Towers. Okay, that's Trump's building. We don't know who actually did the work. There's a picture of this with um, Moses when he's building the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. It says that Moses made everything, but it actually was the people that that's he right. gave the ability to do all that. Yeah. But they gave Moses the credit. That's right. That's a good picture. So Yah created man in his own image. In the image of Yah created he him. 
male and female created he them. Okay, keep going. And Yah blessed them. And Yah said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Okay, here's the thing. He hasn't made two of them yet, has he? He's only made one. So we're getting an account of the story, an account of the creation that is accounting for the details that no one was there to see. The person who wrote this was not there. You guys know that, right? Who wrote Genesis? Adam? Adam didn't write Genesis. Who wrote Genesis? Moses. Moses. Was Moses there? No. So you have to understand, like when you put yourself in the story, you'll realize Moses is telling you how man was created. He's lumping them all together, and then he's going to get very specific because Moses has a speech impediment. He repeats himself. So Genesis chapter 2, he's going to start repeating himself. That's what I mean by the precepts. Here we go. And were you reading? Somebody else can read. Mm. Where are we at? No, hold on real quick. Uh, okay, verse 28. Just I just need... This is the first line out of there. Then we have to jump down just a little bit. And Yah blessed them. And Yah said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Pause. So we can jump there. I want you to see that it's a them now. That's the way that Moses is describing it. Jump down to verse 31. And Yah saw everything that he made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening... And the morning were the sixth day. So he worked on the sixth day and he made man. Go to Genesis chapter 2. So real quick, um, all of this was told to him when he was on the mountain in that 40 days. I don't know when it was told to him. Wow. I just believe what he said. I don't know if it happened. <laughs> it could have happened at the burning bush. I don't know when he told him this stuff. The Bible doesn't say. But I believe it though. Okay, watch. Genesis chapter 2 and give me uh, verse 2. And on the seventh day, Yah ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day for all, from all his work, which he had made. Okay. Does he make anything after the seventh day? After the sixth day? He doesn't make anything on the seventh day. Does he wait for another day to make anything else? All his work, which he had made. Okay, so now watch this jump down to verse 7. No, no, verse 4. Verse 4 tells you that it's a reiteration. Verse 4 tells you that he's going to tell you again. Go ahead. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day that Yahweh, Alahayim, Alahayim, Yahweh, made the earth and heavens okay what did he just say these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth he says that multiple times these are the generations of adam this is the Jenny, the generations of seth he right it's a breakdown it's a reiteration 50 people will have been born and then he'll go back and say and this is their generations of everything that has already been made watch this verse 5 and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For Yahweh Alahayim had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. That makes sense so far, because what day did he make all the plants? Fourth day. What day did he make the man? Six. Sixth day. Okay, so we're still within that six day time period, ain't that right? Okay, verse 6 says, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. Why did that happen? Because there was no man to till the ground. Tell me the story about how he created the man. Verse 7. And Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground. This is a different day? Mm -hmm. It's the same day. He's retelling the story of what just took place. Keep going. And breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Amen. So some people do teach that this is a whole different time period that he created all of mankind and then created Adam separately. But then that would break the scripture that says Adam was the first man. The Bible says Adam was the first man. So we, we know there's no contradiction in the scriptures, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, it definitely clears a lot up 
Um, when I first heard that, uh, the person was saying that uh, part of that uh, doctrine, I guess, comes because the man, the word, it's two different. One says mankind and the other says Adam. It depends on what version you're reading. And we just clearly read it. It said man. And we looked at the Hebrew and it said Adam. And Adam is not mankind. So we don't get, yeah, man's kind until after Seth has a son. That's in Ayash in Hebrew. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. The Bible will prove itself, though, if he created a whole gang of people and then waited some time to create Adam or created Adam on a different day other than the sixth day, then this scripture right here would be broken. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was who, made. Who was the first man? Adam. Go ahead. Was made a living soul. Uh-huh. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Okay, so that scripture just clearly told me that Adam was the first man. I just got to believe what it says. And so, you know, when I had first heard that, that gave me an explanation for who was Cain's, um, uh, who was, uh, uh, Cain's wife and who were the people that Cain was afraid was going to kill him. Mm. Right. So there are people that... Uh, believe that also but when you take if you put yourself in any one of these stories it will all start to make sense like literally these people lived for 900 years how long does Cain need to wait before he's going to find a wife how many years she's going to be about what 20 he lived until he was like five six seven hundred years old it's easy for him to find a wife, but if you don't account for the time, it makes it seem like he left out of the presence of the Most High and went and found a wife. No, he was a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, walking around for hundreds of years. What was happening in the rest of the world? Jubilees and Jasher, they tell you what was happening in the rest of the world. Seth was having sons and daughters, and they were multiplying, they were keeping the commandment, and at some point, Cain comes across one of the daughters of Seth, and he marries her. Hundreds of years later, if I live to be 500 years old, I can marry somebody who's 200 years old. Is that considered his niece, or is, since he's the serpent seed, is it not his niece? He's a different seed, so technically, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> We will get in a rabbit hole. What you got? Talking to Mike. You looked shocked for a second. So yeah. go ahead. Talk, talk. You said the seed of Cain is another seed? I just want to hear a yes, yes or no. Okay. Yes is the answer. Got you. Okay. Yeah, the Bible tells you uh, that Cain is not in the lineage of Adam. Yeah, when the Bible tells you these are the descendants of Adam, Cain is not listed there. Cain has his own lineage. Because he's a different bloodline. Okay, rabbit hole. What you got, sister? Talking to Mike, please. Um, I've been asked this question. I've been trying to explain, but wanted to hear your thoughts on it. On Shabbat, you, you explained about the nation, the other nation being joined to Israel. Is, are Israelites allowed to marry other nations? Mm, okay. The answer is yes. Let me explain to you who Israelites are not allowed to marry. So if we were not allowed to marry any other nation, there would be no need to say you can't marry this nation and that nation and this nation because the answer to the question is you can only marry an Israelite. Does that, does that part make sense? Okay, so who are Israelites commanded not to marry? Moabites. And Cannot marry a Moabite, nor an Ammonite. Ammonite. Or a ham, Hamite. Nor a Hamite. Another mite. One of other mites. That's good enough. Yeah. That so, in modern terms. I know Hamite is... Hamite is I, an African. Yeah. God, Ammonite is a Japanese. Asian. It's Chinese. And Ammonite is 
uh, Ammonite is a Japanese. Yeah, that is an interpretation. So I need to make it very clear that is an interpretation. If you don't believe that interpretation, please search the scriptures and find the interpretation that you believe according to the history of Ammon and Moab. So, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I thought Moab was uh, Chinese. Moab is, did I, did I say it's different? Moab is Chinese. Ammon is Japanese. Japanese. Oh, okay. Yeah, did I, did I mix, mix it up? A little bit. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. A Moab is Chinese, Ammon is Japanese. So what will be considered to be unequal yoke? Unequally yoked. Time? Watch this, let's take a look at that scripture. They get exposed to the truth and they remain in a state of not believing. They've been exposed to the truth, but they still choose not to believe. They're in unbelief. That's an unbeliever. Now the unbeliever, is that the person from like Psalms 14? Is that the fool? Do they say there's no God? Is the unbeliever? The unbeliever? Yeah. Okay. The unbeliever says there is no God or the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay. The non-believer just doesn't know him yet. Get to know him. Now watch this understanding that one line will line up with first Corinthians chapter seven. Yeah. These mics are popping and clicking. If there's a mic on your table and you're not using it, uh, if you have not asked any questions in the whole Bible study, go ahead and turn your mic off. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 13. This is regarding marriage. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not. Okay, watch. Does he believe? No. Has, so what, would, what are we going to call him? A non-believer or unbeliever? Non-believer. He's a non-believer. I'm going to prove that. Keep going. And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Okay, so he's pleased to dwell with her. That means he sees her keeping all of these commandments. She not cooking on the Sabbath, but he love her. He don't know Yah, but he's pleased to dwell with her. That means he's able to keep these commandments and the commandments are not grievous. Does that make sense? Can she leave? Let her not leave him because he's a non-believer. Keep going. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Uh-oh. The unbelieving, wait, the unbelieving is sanctified by the wife. Keep going. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Uh-huh. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Okay, so this person is in a state of unbelief. Does that part make sense? Now, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. What's the only thing that's keeping this man breathing? The wife. His wife. Because if it wasn't for that wife, he would get cut off. So now we've seen the non-believer. Now we see the unbeliever. Look at verse 15's commandment. But if the unbelieving depart. What I need to do? Let him go. Well, he, he's been exposed to the truth and he don't want no part of these commandments. He's not pleased to dwell. Does that make sense? So he needs to go. Let him, he's unbelieving anyway. He's been exposed. We've been breaking down these scriptures. You want to go? Go. Go ahead. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but Yah hath called us to peace. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So we went there because that precept relates to non-believers versus unbelievers, which most people are not, they read so fast, they're not even aware that there's a difference between a non-believer and an unbeliever. You got something, Mike? Did we get back online? We're back. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, I got a question. Oh. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, ask your question. It's um, between two verses. Matthew 5, 16 is the first one. And then uh, Matthew 6, 1 through 4. The first one, Matthew 5 says, we can go ahead and go there, I guess. Matthew 5 what? 16. 5, 16. All right. Let me pull it up. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your, your Father which is in heaven. And mm -hmm. then Matthew 6. 
talking to Mike. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Or excuse me. Yeah, 1 through 4. Take heed that... Oh, let me get there. Apologies. This is a great question, Monty. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. It sounds like it's two different things. Okay. Uh, all right. That's a great question. Read verse 1 again. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men. Pause there. What's alms? Good deeds. Works. Good deeds. Okay. And now read line two and it tells you why you're doing it in front of men to be seen of them what are you doing it for to be seen of them recognition okay. now watch otherwise ye have no reward of your father which is in heaven why you've already been rewarded you've already received your reward what did you want people to see you do something good you've already received your reward okay but now let's go back to matthew chapter 5 verse 16 yeah yes Read that line again. Let let, your, go ahead, G. Let your light, let your light so shine before men. That Pause they there. Know. Pause there. Let your light so shine. What's the light? Yahweh Shai. The law. You say Yahweh Shai. He's the light right. too. He's the light too. So is but, it saying like so? Well, when I say Yahweh Shai, mm -hmm. I'm just saying like the deeds that you do on your day to day basis should be like him. Mm -hmm. Is that what they're saying? Yeah. So let your all right. Let the fact that you keep the law, statutes, and commandments, and believe in the testimony of Yahweh Shai, shine before men. This word glory, the root of the word is glow. Glow has to do with light. Nothing that is. Uh, in order for it to shine, it has to glow. It has to be glorious. Okay, now watch. Let your light, that's the commandments, so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. What are they looking at? The fruit that you're producing. That, the fruit that you're producing. That's perfect. And what is it going to cause them to do? They're and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this is almost like, I mean, it's a little different. But like with, when Jonah was on the ship, so through him, you know, everything mm. that happened, the people that were on the ship, they glorified the father. That's right. For what he was going yeah. through. Yeah, so to speak. absolutely. So what's the difference between these two verses? In verse 16, I'm doing these things so that people can see that I keep the commandments so that the father can be glorified. In verse 6, I'm doing these good things so that people can see that I'm a good person so I can be glorified. See the difference? Yeah, and there's a huge difference in regards to the blessings that you get in regards to how how, how you are operating on a day-to-day -day basis like this. Yeah. There's like a testimony of my own life. I know at the beginning of my walk, I would kind of do things so people could see that I had changed. Mm. And I mean, I was proud of my change. So, you know what I mean? When you're proud of something, you want people to see so forth and so on. But now I just do it automatically because I love the father. Right. And the response that I get is different from people. I don't have to do anything for them to see. They, I do. And they already see if that makes sense. Amen. Uh, and at work, it's really evident. Like over the course of the year, I hear the testimonies of the men. I don't say anything to them, but their testimonies are, I think that's from the light or from the fruit that I produce, it allows them not to say that's Gary, that's Yah operating through Gary. Amen. Let your light shine, don't let your shine shine. Amen. Don't let your shine shine. I have um, Revelations chapter 22. Revelation 22? Verse 12. Revelation 22, 12. It says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Amen. That's good. That's a good verse. The follow-up question? On yeah. That? Go ahead. So if there's opportunities when there's a bunch of people around to do something good. What are you doing it for? So that you can right. be seen or so that he can be right. seen? That's, the, that's what it comes down to. It's your intention. It's where's your heart at. Right. 
right? Because remember, there's going to be some people who say, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils and did many wonderful works in your name? And then he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Ye don't, workers of iniquity. Don't go, hey, somebody's going to see you. Like, I still let, let, your, like, I let your light shine for Yah, not for you. What do you say? Wouldn't, uh, Discernment. Pardon, wouldn't the difference, part of the difference between those scriptures would be that the one we're saying, you know, let let uh, let them see your light. It's referring to the the commandments, mm -hmm. as that's different as opposed to alms. Yes, we may be commanded to give alms, but that's a different work than that's right. being obedient to the to the law. Absolutely, I'm glad you pointed that what out. What does that let's, mean? Need, let's what, talk about the difference. Alms are good deeds. You are commanded to do good to good people. Scripture says, help the godly man, but don't help the sinner. Amen. Okay. Go to Matthew chapter six. Let's take a look at verses one, two, and three and then, and four. And then we're going to break that part down. What the alms are. And then there's an online question that goes with this. With this. Okay. Go. Wait, ask the question first. Cause so I can think to cover. It. Oh, uh, so they want, um, an explanation on Matthew six, 23. Um, it says, uh, can you explain Yahweh's meaning by if the light in oh, that, you that be dark? Work. That's a different one. That's different. We're going to cover alms and then we'll get to that light. Okay. Okay. Uh, Matthew chapter six, verse one. Go ahead, somebody. Take heed that ye not your alms. That do ye not, do. Do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Okay, so you don't have a reward. And you have a said the reward is with me. I'm bringing it. Okay, watch this. Go to Tobit, chapter 4, verse 5. We're going into the Apocrypha, chapter 4, verse 5. My son, be mindful of Yahweh, our Elohim, all thy days. And let not thy will be set in, be set to sin, mm. or to transgress his commandments. Mm -hmm. Do uprightly all thy life long, and follow not thy ways of unrighteousness. Keep going. For if thou deal truly, thy doings shall prosper, pros, prosperously succeed to thee. Uh -uh. So, for if thou deal truly, if you have true dealings, if everything that you do is righteous, thy doings shall prosperously succeed to thee. What does that mean? Your reputation precedes you. It goes before you, before you even show up, they heard about what a good man you are. Keep Amen. going. And to all them that live justly. Keep going. Give alms of thy substance. Pause right there. What do I do? How do I give alms? Of thy substance. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I give alms of what I have. What do I have? My cup runneth over because the most high blesses me because I keep his commandments. Yes. Keep going. And when thou givest alms, let not thy eyes be envious. Mm. Neither turn thy face from any poor. Mm -hmm. And the face of Yah shall not be turned away from thee. Wow. Keep going. If thou hast abundance, give alms accordingly. Wait a minute. If I got a lot, what do I give? A lot. That's right. I can help a lot of people. Keep going. If thou have but a little... Be not afraid to give according to that little. So if I only have a little, I got to give it in faith. Amen. Keep going. For thou layest up a good treasure for thyself against the day of necessity. Okay. So this is where Yahweh gets the saying, but lay up treasure in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt. Everything that he said comes from a scripture. He didn't make up anything because he said, I didn't come to speak my own words. I came to speak the father's words, which sent me. Does that all make sense? So that's the beginning of our understanding on giving Psalms. Go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 8. This is going to tell you how you do it. Somebody says to you, hey, brother, you got a couple dollars? What do you do? Do you have a couple dollars? Yeah. Can you give it? Yeah. Then what do you do? You give it. That's simple. Okay. Watch. Unless you know they're going to do something evil with that money. Unless they're going to use it to break the commandments or hurt themselves or hurt somebody else. Okay. Keep going. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 8. I'm sorry. Oh, my bad. I'm hungry. Romans chapter 12. That's my bad. Romans chapter 12, verse 8. And prevailed not, neither was their place found. Nah. Romans 12, 8. Or he that exhorteth, or exhortation. Mm -mm. Or he, he that exhorteth. On. He on exhortation he needs to work on he's waiting on his exhortation go ahead he that giveth let him do with simplicity if you're gonna be somebody who gives how should you do it simplicity make it simple the person asked if you can do it then just do it keep it simple don't be like well brother you gotta come to church with me and you gotta do <laughs> what in the world Bro, he hungry. Just give him some food. He more likely to come to church with you after you give him the food than if you put a, a stipulation on it. Well, I'll give it to you. Does that make sense? Okay, but you don't give it to them if it's going to break the commandments. It's going to harm them or harm somebody else. Finish that verse real quick. He that ruleth with diligence. Mm. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Okay. Go back to Matthew chapter 6 and let's get into that verse 2 because he's going to tell you how not to give psalms now. <laughs> and you're going to see this is exactly what he's talking about in Matthew 5, 16. 6 what? 6 what? So in Matthew 6, 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms... Do not sound a trumpet before thee. Do, do, do. I'm about to feed the homeless. <laughs> in your <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Oh, they're hypocrites who do that. Go ahead. That they may have glory of men. Wait, they want the glory of men. They want the shine that comes from men, not the shine that comes from keeping the commandments. Keep going. Verily, I say unto you. They have their reward. They got their reward. Soon as men are like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You got your reward, bro. Go to Tobit. Back to Tobit chapter 12, verse 8. Tobit chapter 12, verse 8. Prayer is a good. Prayer. Prayer is good with fasting and alms and righteousness. Mm. A little with righteousness is better than much with unrighteousness. That's right. It is better to give alms than to lay up gold. That's right. It's better for you to give of your substance. Yahweh Shai said to the man, he said, one thing thou lackest, go sell everything you own and give to the poor and come and follow me. And oh boy, it was like, uh-uh, I ain't doing that. You tripping. He went away sorrowful. Why? He had great possessions. Here's the thing. If you're not careful, all of the things that you possess will end up possessing you. Okay, verse 9, go ahead. For alms doth deliver from death and mm. shall purge away all sin. Wait a minute, alms deliver from death? Don't be thinking about yourself. Think about that hungry person that you're giving the alms to. Right. That dude is at the point to die. The alms that you give him, that bread that you give him may deliver him from death. Go ahead. And shall purge away all sin. Those that exercise alms and righteousness shall be filled with life. Keep one more verse. But they that sin are enemies to their own life. Okay. Amen. The book of Tobit talks quite a bit about alms because Tobias was teaching his son how to be a man of Yah. Go back to Matthew chapter 6, and we're at verse 3 and 4, and then we got to wrap it up. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what the right, thy right hand doeth. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. You don't do it for recognition? You don't even think twice about it. You do it in faith. Just reach into your pocket and pull it out, bro. All right. Keep going. One more verse. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Amen. I got a follow-up question on that. Like every time, you know, you go to QT or Circle K and there's people out front, you know, 
they're, they're asking for money, mm -hmm. how do we uh, discern on such a quick interaction with them if we are supposed to give to them or not? Okay. If the person says to you, hey, bro, you got any change? You do have change. If the person says to you, I'm hungry, which of these two people are you more likely to help? The hungry. Yeah. You're at the QT and the guy says, do you have 20 bucks? I ain't got 20 bucks. But he says, can you help me with gas? My car is right there. I can put some gas in your tank, but I cannot put $20 in your pocket. I can put some food in your belly, but I am not about to give you any amount of money. And that requires discernment. Amen? Amen. Okay. Any other questions regarding those things? The giving of alms. Any other questions? So we're about five minutes over, and we do have a baptism that we're going to do. So it's pouring raining outside? Oh, that's okay. They're already wet. No, no. It's, it's who was planning to get baptized? You are planning to get baptized? Check it. Yeah? Is it raining though? It's is it raining though? It's that lightning inside the tub? No, they, they, it is a metal tub, so. <laughs> I ain't scared though. Sister, did you still want to get baptized while you're here or would you? Yes, amen. And we're going to do this in faith. Absolutely not. All right, hallelujah. Um, any other last minute questions, comments, or concerns that we need to cover? Eunice has a question on this that she just threw on there. Yes, let's get to it. If you try and feed someone slash help them and they rob you, should you let them? You're trying to, you're trying to help somebody and they end up doing something evil to you. But the question is, should you let them? Should you let them do the evil thing? They've already done the evil thing. So should you let them do, continue to do evil to you? No, right? If, if you are attempting to help someone and your good is being evil spoken of, that's how the Bible refers to it, stop doing that thing. The Most High did not make you a doormat. He didn't make, make you something for people to walk on. But that's a discernment issue. We have to be wise about who we should be helping. Amen. All right. Any other last minute questions, comments, or go? We seem to have a discrepancy on what Ayanda Bar means and how it's spelled. Can you okay. clear that up for everybody? Yeah. Uh, is that in the chat? How's it spelled? Mark spelled it with an L in the chat tonight. Okay. So if you spell it with an L, you were saying Landa Bar. Landabar doesn't mean anything in Hebrew. Ayan Dabar means it's no thing. Some Israelites spell it with an A. The word is actually spelled with an I. It's Ayan Dabar. But when you're typing, the uppercase I looks like a lowercase L. That's why people are making that mistake. Does that make sense? Ayan the bar, the bar is thing. It's no thing. That's how you say you're welcome. I am the bar. Amen. Any other last minute questions, comments, or concerns? Hallelujah. Somebody pray for us and we will wrap it up. Thank you, Father, for revealing your word to us, showing us the way, uh, uh, giving us your scriptures, giving us your son, uh, best gift ever. In his name we pray. Yahweh Shai. Amen. Amen. Okay.